Hello everyone, this video covers section 4.3, how derivatives affect the shape of the graph. Now, technically, we have done this already, so now we're just going to make it official, and this is what I mean. So far, and by that I mean section 4.1 and 4.2, what you learn is that you have a, a graph, okay? the the critical point is going to be where the derivative is equals to zero so this will be a critical point and this will be a critical point okay? so remember f prime of c equals to zero or f prime of c does not exist that's what we call critical points so that's what we did before so so far we found critical points which is where the derivative is zero, so let me make one that is easier to see. And this will be a critical point also. This will be a critical point. And remember this will be called a relative minimum or a local minimum, and this will be a relative uh, maximum. So what we're going to do in this, uh, this section we're still going to find maximum and minimum for the first part. There is a new um, a new thing we're going to do, but again, it's not really new. So if this is a critical point, you can see that the slope there is always positive. So this means that F is increasing. So F is increasing. It's the same thing as F prime is, uh, is positive. So you can see that before you get to that point, x is always uh, towards positive. And then, f is, uh, the, the slope is negative, so here f is decreasing. But how do we know it's the f is decreasing? It's because f prime is negative in this interval from here to here, okay? And so for here, uh, the slope is positive so again here f is increasing and also that means that f prime is positive in there now if you think about it this is technically common common sense the derivative is positive at this point then zero negative zero and positive so again what we're going to do right now is not really not really new we're just making it more formal so let me do a quick illustration which is just a quick example let's say that f of x was equals to minus uh, 16x squared plus 64x plus 80 okay? and you wanted to find uh, where this is increasing where this is decreasing and the uh, critical critical points so we will start with the critical points so notice that f prime is equals to minus 32 x plus 64 so f prime equals to zero that means that minus 32 x equals to minus 64 which means that x equals to two so this will be the the critical point Right, and as you can see, you only have one critical point, x equals to, to two. Since Now, since you only have a critical point, it should be obvious that there is only two things that can happen. At x equals to two, the slope is zero, and either on this side is doing this and this, or the other choice is this, it's going down and then up. Those are the only two choices you have if the derivative is zero of x equals to two. Okay? Now to decide which one, you can go to the to the number line. I will put zero for reference, so two is here, so this is the critical point. And then we're gonna check to see what happens with the derivative to the derivative to the sign of the derivative, which is which is this one. So let's say that you pick x equals two to four. So x is 4, and you plug it in here, this number, which is negative, is going to be bigger than this one. So 
So from here, the derivative will be negative. So f prime will be negative here. And if you pick a number in here, let's say zero to make it easier. You can see that this is uh, zero and this is positive. So on this side of the critical point, it will be positive, which means the derivative is positive or is increasing. So pretty much what's happening is, you know that at x equals to two, since that's a critical point, the slope is zero. So it will be flat here. Before that, this is increasing because the derivative is positive and then it's decreasing because the derivative is negative. And clearly, you can see that this will be a relative relative maximum. So this will be a relative maximum. Now, this should not be surprising. If you look at this, this is just a quadratic equation, which technically that's this. So this is the, the vertex. So it should be obvious that this is a, it's a maximum. Okay. Now, this process we just did here is actually called the first derivative test. So what the first derivative test says is this, you find the critical, you use the derivative to find the critical point, which in this case is two, and then you check if the derivative is positive or negative on the other side. If it changes from positive to negative, and I highly, highly recommend you to do a diagram like the one I did here. So if it goes from positive to negative, clearly it will be a maximum. And if it goes from negative to positive, it will be a, a minimum. Okay. So let me write that. So the first derivative test says the following. If you have a critical point, let's say the critical point is here. And you end up with something like this. So this is the most basic example. And then here is another critical point. Why? Because the the derivative is zero there. So if you go from positive, so if f prime is positive, well, f prime like is positive, and then it changes to to negative, well, this will be a, a maximum. And then if it changes from negative to positive, then it will be a, a minimum. That's what the first derivative test says. Now, sometimes you have the case where it changes from positive to positive, like this. Let's say this is a critical point. You can see here f prime is positive here, and then f prime is also positive. So therefore, this is not a critical point, actually, and this one is always increasing or equals to zero at some point but this is not a maximum or a minimum okay and the same thing will be the case if it does this if it goes from negative to negative so it has to change from negative to positive or positive to negative for you to say there is a maximum or a minimum and you need to have a critical point. Again, if you have a graph, it's obvious where this is increasing, where this is zero, where this is decreasing, and so forth. If you only have the equation like this, which is typically how many of the questions are asked, then your job is you can actually graph it first if you want to, or you find the critical points first, and then just check to see what is positive and what is negative. And from there you decide if it's a maximum or a minimum. Okay, so let's find the critical points first. So f prime will be six x squared minus 18 x plus 12. So remember you want f prime to be zero. So that means that you can factor the six. This will be x squared minus three x plus two equals to zero. From here, you can factor this as x minus 2, x minus 1. So that means the critical points are x equals to 2 and x equals to 1. Right? Then, you need to determine where is this increasing, where is decreasing, 
and usually they also ask you for the maximum and minimum so it's a very very good idea to do a table like this always put zero for reference the two critical points are one and two so remember that at this point the derivative is zero and now we are definitely checking for the derivative not the function and we're going to apply this into these values right here so if you pick x equals to zero you can see that this will be negative and this will be negative so you will have negative times negative which the whole thing will be positive so that means the derivative here is positive anything in here okay now let's say you pick 1.5 this will be negative this will be positive so you're gonna have negative times positive the whole thing will be negative so at this point therefore the derivative is negative and let's say you pick 10 in here it will be positive and positive and you can check whole thing will be positive okay so now like i say already you should always do a graph so you know at this point this is zero and then at this is zero so this one this one is increasing then it gets to this point and decreases and then it is, gets to this point is equals to zero you don't know where the zero is going to go so just make a line and you can always erase it and then after that it increases so obviously you can see that this is increasing where this is positive so this is positive from minus infinity to to one or from uh, two to infinity and clearly this is decreasing just from one to now there is a relative maximum at x equals to 1 and a relative minimum at x equals to 2. Now you want to find the actual values, you have to plug it in, in here. So for example for this one, the relative maximum will be f of f of 1 which will be 2 minus 9 plus 12 minus 3 which is equals to 2 that will be the maximum if you want to find the minimum then the minimum will be f of 2 and just plug it in so again just to clarify this stuff is very very simple okay so you have a function the hard part of this could be if this function is not this nice and to take the derivative is a little more more messy okay but you find the derivative say it equals to zero or to undefined to find the critical points and once you find the critical points then you check the size because it's going to be either negative positive and it's going to change sign if it changes from negative so, sorry if it changes from positive to negative it's going to be a maximum if it changes from negative to positive, it's going to be a minimum. And that's it. And then the positive part is the intervals where it's increasing. And the negative is where it's decreasing. That's it. So it's very, very simple. Now, before I go in detail into the concavity test, concavity uh, is related to the to the second, second derivative. So this one, you need to find the second derivative, but concavity is this let's go back to a very basic function so again let's say we have something like this okay so f is concave up or upward if or is concave upward in some interval i if f double prime is positive there so if the second derivative is positive on so interval then this will be concave up 
Now, if f is sorry, f is concave down or downward in some interval i if f double prime is negative okay. now here this part right here from here to here this is what it means to be concave down just think about that you're holding water with your hand so if the water will fall it will be concave down so this will be what we mean by concave down and this part this will be uh, concave up so usually i'm just gonna say c d for concave down and c a for concave up okay? now the part where it changes from one concavity to another is where it changes concavity that is called the inflation point so this is the called the inflation point and this is where it changes concavity and that means it can go from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up so that's what the inflation point now the inflation point to inflate the inflation point to find the inflation point this is going to be equals to or you're going to find the where the second derivative is equals to zero so z is an inflation point if the derivative is equal to zero In the previous example, we have the following function. We have that f of x was equals to 2x to cubed minus 9x squared plus 12x uh, minus 3. And the question was to find the, the intervals where it was increasing, decreasing, and the relative maximum, relative minimum. So the derivative there was, remember, 6x squared minus 18x plus 12. Well, now the second derivative is going to be 12x minus 18. So therefore, we can find the inflation point if we say the derivative equals to 0. So this means that 12x has to be 18. Or x is equal to 18 over 12. Remember, this is 6 times 3, this is 6 times 2, so this is equals to 1.5. Now, to determine where this will be concave up and concave down, we do the exact same thing we did, but now we're going to use the second derivative. So 1.5, remember, this is the inflation point. And then we're going to check a number here and a number here. So let's say we pick 2. If you plug in 2 in here, you can see that it will be positive so this will be concave up and if you play in here let's say uh, one you can see that it will be negative so here it will be concave concave down remember concave down means this and concave up means this that's it now in the previous page uh, we talk about the first derivative test and remember the first derivative test tells you that if you have a critical point if it changes from positive to negative is a maximum and negative to positive is a relative minimum now you can also use the second derivative to determine if something is a maximum or a, or a minimum and this is what you do so suppose the c is a critical point so this is the this is very important remember that you get the critical points from the first first derivative so then if f double prime of c is positive then that implies this is a 
minimum and if f double prime at the critical point is negative that implies that's a that's a maximum so this is what the second derivative test says okay now just to verify that this is the case remember that from here at uh, this problem from here actually it had two critical points and the two critical points were remember uh, x equals to one x equals to two and we found at that point that this was a minimum and that this one was a maximum okay now if we use the second derivative test it should give us the same conclusion so how much will be f double prime of one so if we put one in here this will be 12 times 1 minus 18 which clearly is negative and according to this this should be a, a maximum which is exactly what we got before and if you do f double prime of 2 this will be 12 times 2 minus 18 which is positive and according to the second derivative test if it's a positive it should be a minimum which is exactly what we got before so you can see that this is another way to to check if something is a maximum or a minimum all right let's do another example this one the derivative is a little more tricky but it's the it's the same thing all right so let's start with uh let's find the critical points so f prime is going to be 4x q e to the minus x minus e to the minus x times x to the 4 which you can actually factor the x q e to the minus x and it will be 4 minus x therefore the the critical points f prime equals to 0 this will happen only if x is equals to 0 for this one or x equals to 4 for this one right here Remember that e to the minus x is never zero. So the only critical points are this, this two. Now let's find the inflation point. Remember the inflation point is where the second derivative is equals to zero. So f double prime will be a four and this will be a three x square e to the minus x and then minus e to the minus x times x q so that's for the the first part which is this this is the derivative done then you can take out the minus sign out and then this will be a 4 x q e to the minus x the minus e to the minus x x to the 4. if we expand this you get a 12 x square e to the minus x minus 4 e to the minus x x q minus 4 x q e to the minus x plus e to the minus x x to the 4. now you can factor um at least x square e to the minus x this will be 12 minus a x and then this will be plus x square which factors to x square e to the minus x x minus 6 and x minus 2 therefore uh, f double prime equals to 0 implies x is 0 x is 6 and x equals to 2 so these are the inflation points so this one has three inflation points and remember that means it's where it changes concavity now since we already now have the the derivative which is this or this one the second derivative you can use this to determine uh, whether these are maximums or minimum or you can use the first first derivative test so let's use the second derivative test so if we use the the second derivative test now notice that we have uh, two critical points the two critical points are x equals to zero and x equals to four these were the critical points so how much is f double prime of zero 
If we put a double prime here, this will be, will be zero. So the whole thing will be equals to, to zero. So therefore you can uh, determine using this one because it has to be either negative or positive. But what about f double prime of four? So for zero, you may have, you may need to use the first derivative test. So how much is f of four? f of four, this will be uh, positive, it will be negative, and it will be positive. So the whole thing will be negative. And remember, negative means this is a, it's a maximum. You should use the first derivative test to verify that. So what this means is, remember, when you are on four and you use the first derivative test, that means that this side is going to be positive, it gets to zero, and it will be negative. But you can see that in here. If x equals to 4 is a critical point, let's say you can pick number 5. If you pick 5, it will be negative. This part is always positive, and it will be uh, positive. So positive times positive times negative will give you a negative number. So this will go down, and here it will be positive. So clearly this is a, a max, okay? Or uh, use the first derivative test, okay? All right, so in the next section, we're gonna go back to do limits. Remember we did a lot of limits in chapter two but now we're going to incorporate derivatives, which is going to make finding limits easier. Kind of, you will see right now. So section 4.4 is called L'Hopital's Rule. And L'Hopital's Rule is one of the most useful tools from calculus that you will be using over and over. And you're going to use L'Hopital's Rules when you have something that are called undetermined forms then we have the following undetermined forms if you have infinity over infinity here remember we are going to find limits okay. so when you have infinity over infinity that's considered undetermined if you have zero over zero this is also undetermined and we actually deal with this in a very specific way in chapter two. So now it's gonna be a lot easier to deal with this. Also undetermined could be you have one to the infinity, okay? Or zero to the infinity. You have to be careful because this, even though it's undetermined, we can, uh, or L'Hopital's rule doesn't apply here or it doesn't apply to something like this, okay? So we're gonna mainly focus on this one, actually, this, the first three, okay? So first I'm gonna do some examples that we actually did in chapter two, but now we're gonna do it the easy way using L'Hopital's rule. And I'm gonna tell you how L'Hopital's rule works by doing a specific example before, besides, before giving you the actual definition. For example, in, um, in section 2.1, somewhere when limits were introduced, you had to find a limit like this. Okay. And actually at that point, there was no way to find the, to find the limit. So you had to just, uh, remember you have no clue, what you do is just start plugging values closer and closer to zero, and that should give you an idea where the limit is. So Lupiter rule makes life pretty easy because it does this. So first, you check that you will get one of these forms. And you're going to do this separately. So as x goes to 0, clearly sine of x is 0. And x goes to 0 too. That's no, no secret. Okay. So therefore, that means you can use L'Hopital's rule. And what L'Hopital's rule that is the following. You should put a L H here to imply you're gonna use L'Hopital's rule. So you're still gonna find the limit as X goes to zero. So this part stays the same. 
nothing changes. But now you're going to do the derivative of this, the derivative of this. This is not the caution rule, okay? You do the derivative of this, the derivative of this, and take the limit. So what's the derivative of sine? To so the derivative with respect to x of sine is cosine x. So then this goes here. And the derivative with respect to x of x was clearly just 1. And now uh, take the limit separately from the top and the bottom. Well, the bottom is clearly just 1. The top is 1, so the answer is 1. And that's it. All right, let's try another example similar to what we did in chapter 2. Let's say that the question is to find the limit as x goes to 3 of x minus 3, and this was x squared minus 9. Notice that what you did before, remember first you check that this was 0 over 0, and then you factor this and cross things out, okay? But now, using a L'Hopital's rule, uh, you're still going to find just the limit as x goes to 3, still. But now you take the derivative of the top. The derivative of this is 1. And then the derivative of the bottom is just 2x. And this will be now 1 over 2 times 3, which is 1 over 6. And that's it. So in general, so in general, what L'Hopital's rule says is this. If uh, you have the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals to g of x gives you a undetermined form, which would be this, or it could be this, or one of the other ones, then you can use L'Hopital's rule and it will still be the limit as x goes to a of f prime over g prime. By the way, you can apply L'Hopital's rule more than once. So if this one was still 0 over 0, you can do it one more time. You can, in fact, do it multiple times until you get the, the answer. All right, so let's do a, a few examples. And again, this is one of the most useful tools, along with the... This is like technically the the limit version of the chain rule. Remember, you can do the chain rule, you can take the derivative of anything, so you can do Laplace, uh, not Laplace, uh, L'Hopital's rule, you can take the limit technically of anything. All right, so here, the limit as x goes to zero of tangent, remember it's zero, because tangent of zero is zero, and sine of zero is zero. So this one is good, because you get zero over zero. So then we take the, the derivative, and remember the derivative of tangent is a uh, secant square, so it's going to be 3, secant square of 3x using the, the chain rule. And the derivative of sine 2x is going to be 2 cosine 2x. And then we take the limit again, and remember the secant of 0 is 1, so it will be 3 times 1 squared. And it will be 2 times 1. So the limit is just 3 over 2. And that's it. I mean, just, uh, if you forgot, just recall this. The cosine of 0 is equal to, to 1. Remember, the graph of cosine looks like this. So cosine of 0 is 1. And remember the secant is 1 over cosine. So therefore, if cosine is 1, well, secant will be 1, 2. Now for number 22, before we actually do the problem, recall this, that if you have ln of square of x, this is the same thing as ln of x to the 1 half, which is the same thing as 1 half ln, ln x. It's not really required that you do this, but it will make it, make it easier. Why? Because when you take the limit, you can see the the graph for ln x looks like this. So clearly as x goes to infinity, this goes to goes to infinity. So this will be infinity. And x squared obviously will go to infinity as x goes to infinity. 
So this will be infinity over infinity. So this is okay. So this is good because you have infinity over infinity. So then if you apply a L'Hopital's rule here, we should say that too. Then this is going to be the limit as x goes to infinity of the derivative of this, which is equals to um, 1 over 2x divided by the derivative of x squared, which is equals to x. Now, this uh, simplifies to the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over 4x squared, and this goes to infinity as x goes to, to 0. And so this is infinity. Remember that the graph of 1 over 4x squared looks like this. So the limit from the left and the limit from the right is equals to infinity. Okay, now before we do the next problem, just uh, recall that cosecant x is the same thing as 1 over sine, and that cotangent x is the same thing as cosine over sine. So now, if you plug in the limits uh, directly, or you substitute 0 directly, this will be 1 over 0, which is infinity. And then the other one would also be infinity. And infinity minus infinity is a, is a form that you can uh, work with. So if you say this equals to 0, this is one of the biggest biggest things you can do in mathematics okay so therefore the way that it is L'Hopital's rule cannot be applied so instead you're gonna do algebra and by algebra i mean this um, simplify cosecant x minus cotangent x i just told you that this is a one over sine minus cosine over over sine clearly the lcd is sine so this will be uh, one minus cosine x over sine x so therefore uh, solving this limit or finding this limit is exactly the same thing as the limit as x goes to zero or one minus cosine x over sine x. So now if you apply the, or you substitute zero, remember cosine of zero is one, so one minus one will give you zero, and then on the bottom you will get zero. So now it is okay to apply L'Hopital's rule. So therefore by L'Hopital's rule, this will be the limit as x goes to 0, or the derivative of the top, the derivative of, zero, of 1 is 0, the derivative of cosine is minus sine, so this will be sine, so it's minus, minus sine, and the derivative of sine is uh, cosine. So now this will be equals to the limit as x goes to 0 of sine, which will be 0 over 1, and this is equals to 0, which is perfectly a legitimate number. And that's it. Now, one of the biggest complaints people will do or say, uh, many people will say this, well, infinity minus infinity is should be 0, no? And then we get 0, so why is this not the case? Well, whenever you get infinity minus infinity, this is technically undefined, which means the answer could be anything, because it's 0, 1, 2, and 3. Here is just pure luck that you end up with, uh, with 0. Okay? Remember, even a broken clock is right twice a day. It doesn't mean that it's giving you the right, the right time. So here is just pure, pure coincidence that this and this match. Usually, this will be a completely different number. 
So therefore, you still need to go through this. If you do this on the test, you will get zero points or minus 10 points for doing this. This is completely illegal in mathematics, okay? All right, now let's try number uh, number 60. Before we do number, number 60, let's do an easier version of this, okay? Let's say you wanna find the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the one over x. If you apply the limit directly, you will end up with infinity over one over infinity, which is zero. And just like the previous example, you could say, well, anything to the zero power is one. And in this case, it's actually going to be one, but doesn't mean it's always always the case that you will see in the next example. So therefore, the, the way this is, this is not going to, to work. So you need to come up with a new way to, to do this. And usually the trick is the following. So instead of finding this uh, limit, we're gonna modify it, and we're gonna find the ln of that instead. So let's say let y equals to x to the one over x. So therefore, L and Y is going to be equals to one over X times L and X. Therefore, uh, the limit as X goes to infinity of L and Y is the same thing as the limit as X goes to infinity of L and X over X, which is equals to infinity over infinity. So therefore, you can apply L'Hopital's rule. So by L'Hopital's rule, this is the limit as x goes to infinity of the derivative of one of ln x, which is one over x, divided by the derivative of x, which is one. So this is the same thing as the limit as x goes to infinity of one over x, which is equals to, to zero. Now. Uh, this is the limit of ln y, but you don't want ln y, you want y. So therefore, if ln y is equals to zero, that implies that y is equals to e to the zero, which is equals to one. So therefore, once you have done all this work on the side, then you can say that the limit as x goes to infinity of x over one over x is equals to to one because of all of this okay so now this is a, a small version of what we're going to do in this in this problem number 60 to make it easier let's just change this to to x so let's say that b is equals to one it's the same same thing we'll just make it a little faster you do it this way all right, so then we're gonna do the, the same trick here. Uh, let's say that y is equals to one plus a over x to the x power. Therefore, this implies that ln y is the same thing as x ln of one plus a over x. Remember from trigonometry, the you have ln of x to the p is equals to p ln x. So this is not new. It's something from the past. Now you can simplify this more, and this will be equals to x ln of x plus a over x. The simplification is not really needed, so it depends on your your choice, but you'll see what I mean right now. Now, this implies that L and Y, and I wanna read, write it in this specific way for that reason. This is the same thing as Ln of X plus A over X divided by one over X. Okay, notice that this it's exactly the same thing as this. Okay, so this is the key to the solving the problem. Why is that true? 
well uh, if you have 4 times 5 this is the same thing as 4 uh, sorry the, the same thing as 5 divided by 1 4 just check to convince yourself or yourself that that's the case and that trick even though it's very simplistic is the key to the whole point to I mean to the whole thing because you want to use L'Hopital's rule all right therefore if you take the limit as x goes to infinity of l and y is the same thing as the limit as x goes to infinity of ln of x plus a over x divided by 1 over x and notice that the top is going to be ln 1 because the limit of this is going to be 1 and the bottom is going to be 1 over infinity which is 0 but ln of 1 is also 0 so this is 0 over 0 so this is okay to use uh, L'Hopital's rule so then if we apply L'Hopital's rule this is equals to the limit as x goes to infinity on the bottom the derivative 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared now the derivative at the top may be a little more complicated so you may want to do this is not required but it could make your life easier so notice okay again from precalculus the ln of x plus a over x is the same thing as ln of x plus a minus ln of x and therefore you take the derivative of this this is going to be uh, the derivative of the top which is 1 over x plus a minus 1 over x and then if you find the LCD this will be x minus x plus a divided by x times x plus a which is equals to minus a over x times x plus a therefore uh, you can just rewrite that in there so this will be minus a over x times x plus a the minus uh, simplify so this is the limit as x goes to infinity technically of x squared times a divided by x times x plus a notice that they have the same degree this is a square and this is also a square so the limit of this is just equals to a however remember this is the limit of l and y and we don't want l and y we want just y so this implies that l and y is equals to a or e to the a is equals to y so therefore the limit that you want is going to be equals just to e to the a now it should not be surprising this is one of the most famous limits you need to memorize and i'm pretty sure i talked about this before the limit as x goes to infinity n goes to x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x power is equals to e and remember e is 2.712 and so forth okay now to do this limit you need to do the logs this is one of the things that everybody has to go through and this is a result that you should memorize because you're going to use it over and over not just in this class but in calculus 2 calculus 3 and so forth you still need to know how to derive it for the test and the key is always to do the l and y you take the limit use l'hopital's rule and then once you get the answer you change it back to y and that's it